Now let's take a look at material balance in a water drive reservoir. So in a water drive reservoir, we include the water production and the water encroachment term. So in equation 4.17. There's no arrangement that we can do to give us a straight line in this case, so we simply have to use this equation to make our calculations for gas produced or water encroachment, whatever term that we're looking for. For volumetric reservoirs, this same equation reduces uh, to equation 418. Now let's take a look at some example problems that will uh, give meaning to these equations that we've been talking about. This first example that, that I want to look at is example 4.2 in the text. It's calculating the initial gas in place and the initial reserve of a gas reservoir from the pressure production data for a volumetric reservoir. And again on this slide you can see the data that's given. And now we're going to calculate, we'll solve equation 418 for the reservoir gas pour volume. The initial gas in place uh, by the real gas law then, we simply take that pour volume and divide by the, the formation volume factor, or in this case we have put in the factors for the formation volume factor and calculated a value for G. The gas remaining at the, at the abandonment pressure of 500 PSIA is given by this equation. So the initial gas reserved is going to be the difference from the initial gas in place minus the gas that was in the reservoir at the time of abandonment. That will be equal to the gas reserve or what we could expect to be produced down to that pressure. And that show, is shown here on the last of this slide. Example problem 4.3 calculating water influx and residual gas saturation in a water drive gas reservoir. And again, data is given in the statement of the problem here, as shown in the slide. The initial gas in place is calculated from this equation, the first of this slide. If I substitute uh, this gas in place into equation 413, we can solve for the water encroachment at this pressure. The final water saturation of the flooded portion of the reservoir is given by this expression, where I uh, look at the conate water, the water influx, minus the water produced, divided by the pore space. That gives us S sub W. We calculate a water saturation of 67%. So the resi residual gas saturation at this pressure then would be 33%. Let's take a look at example 4.4, which is using the P over Z plot to estimate the cumulative gas production. Again, we're given, uh, in this case, we're given a gas that's made up of methane, ethane, and N hexane in this composition. We're going to use that information to calculate a z-factor. We're also given p over z data and the gas produced at those. Part A will be what will be the cumulative gas produced when the average reservoir pressure is dropped to 2,000 PSIA. B, assuming the reservoir rock has a porosity of 12 percent, water saturation of 30 percent, Reservoir thickness of 15 feet, how many acres does the reservoir cover? So to get G sub P at 2,000 PSIA, we have to calculate Z and the P over Z value. So we'll use the, the uh, composition of the gas to calculate our pseudo-critical uh, pressure and temperature. And then we'll use the equations that we developed in chapter 2 and the figure 2.2 to calculate the z-factor. We get a value of 0.8 and a p over z then of 2500. If we go to the p over z plot then, or go to the equation for p over z as a function of g sub p, we put in the values uh, at 2500 and we calculate a g sub p of 2.33 uh, billion SCF. Of gas. Part B, um, we substitute a value of P over Z of zero into the straight line equation because if we produce the reservoir all the way down to 
pressure of zero, then we would, uh, the G sub P at that point would reflect what the initial gas in place would be. So we go down to a value of zero. Uh, we calculate a G sub P at that point of 5.11 billion SCF of gas. We recognize that V sub I, the volume that the gas occupies in reservoir units, is equal to G times B sub G I. We then calculate that value of V sub I. V sub I is also equal to A H phi times 1 minus the water saturation. We put in these values then and we can solve for A the uh, aerial extent and we end up with a value of about 366 acres. Now we want to take a look at what we refer to as the gas equivalent of produced condensate and water. I mentioned at the beginning of this discussion that uh, though the, in the reservoir itself the hydrocarbon will remain as a gas in, uh, at the reservoir conditions, as the gas is brought to the surface through the production pipe and into the separator system, we could see some oil, some condensate, come from that separation process. And what we would need to do is take that volume of oil that's being produced on the surface and estimate what that volume occupies as a gas down in the reservoir to help us with some uh, calculations for the volume of gas down in the reservoir. The reservoir gas production, G sub P, that we were calculating in the previous sections includes the separator gas production, the stock tank gas production that we might see as a condensate, and we'll have to convert that stock tank liquid to a gas equivalent, as I mentioned. This figure shows two different typical separation schemes that we might use on the surface. We would bring the well fluid into a primary separator, and then in the first diagram it would go, the liquid from that primary separator would go into a secondary separator. The liquid from the sep secondary separator would go into our stock tank, which would be operating in standard conditions. We would gather the gas produced from the previous separators with the gas that comes off of the stock tank. The total amount of gas would be the surface gas. The liquid coming off of the stock tank would be the condensate, or our N sub P. The bottom part of this figure is a two-stage separator system where there is no secondary separator. Here is an expression, equation 4.19, uh, that would allow us to take that volume that we calculate on, or that we measure on the surface and, cal and calculate what that equivalent volume would be down in the reservoir as a gas. Equation 4.19 uh, expresses the gas equivalent volume as a function of the specific gravity of the condensate and the molecular weight of the condensate. And they are given, and there's an expression for the molecular weight as a function of the specific gravity in equation 420. We can then use that gas equivalent then uh, in an expression to, uh, with, along with our uh, surface gas that we've measured in equation 421 to calculate the total gas produced. When water is produced on the surface as a condensate from the gas phase in the reservoir, it will be fresh water. If we see water that's produced on the surface that has some salt concentration to it, then we probably know that it's from the conate water that's uh, that was there in the reservoir initially. But if it's fresh water, then we need to account for that volume of water uh, in the gas phase. And this slide shows the equation to calculate the volume of any moles that might be produced of fresh water on the surface to its gas equivalent in standard conditions. One of the things that we uh, see in with dry gas reservoirs is the application of those reservoirs as what we call storage reservoirs. 
since the demand for natural gas is, is seasonal, uh, during winter months there's a, a much greater demand uh, for heating uh, purposes than in the summer, then frequently what we'll do is take some of the gas that's um, being produced from, say, an oil reservoir, re-inject that into what we call a storage reservoir during the uh, summer months. During the winter months, we'll produce from that reservoir that gas and then sell that gas. These reservoirs uh, have to be what we call volumetric so that there's no water encroachment coming into the reservoir. The only thing that's happening is the gas that's being stored and produced is from the gas drive mechanism that we discussed earlier in the lecture. In these uh, depleted gas reservoirs that we use as gas storage reservoirs, this slide here is a, uh, shows a plot of P over Z versus G sub P. And again, if we went down to the total uh, gas produced or reservoir pressure of zero, uh, that would uh, be the base gas that we'd have to work with. During the summer months, we would inject gas into this reservoir, and we would go back up the uh, P over Z plot then um, to this point on the curve where it's referred to as the unused gas. During the winter months, we would produce, um, and then we would have this amount of working gas that we would have from the reservoir. Now let's conclude this uh, lecture, this chapter, by talking about some of the limitations of the equations that we've been using and discussing. The precision of the reserve calculations by the volumetric method depends on the accuracy, obviously, of the data that we use in the calculations. The core and log data um, in uniform reservoirs uh, can be very accurate. But if these reservoirs are not uniform, then we could have large errors in estimating what, this, uh, what the gas saturations and what the porosity is throughout the reservoir. Now recognize that when we take core samples, we'll, we're taking it from one well or maybe multiple wells in a, in a reservoir, but those wells are several thousand feet apart. And so when we take a core sample from those individual wells, what we're going to do is extrapolate um, the data that we've measured so that it, we are going to estimate that, that same value, those same values exist throughout the reservoir. And if we have a reservoir that's not uniform, then we could have, as we said, large errors in using those values in those extrapolations. It could range anywhere from 5 to 100 percent in error. In measuring the gas produced on the surface, um, our gas meters are really pretty accurate. Um, however, we do experience some leakage uh, either in the, from the lease itself, from the reservoir itself, or in uh, some of the piping, et cetera, um, or uh, in the separator system. But meters are usually calibrated and accurate to 1%, and so therefore, we have a pretty good idea that the, the gas produced that we're measuring is, is fairly accurate, probably a lot more accurate than the extrapolations that we have to make from our core data. Typically, the gas metering will be less than, the, any errors associated with that will be less than 2%. So under the best circumstances, the general material balance uh, estimates that we have made in earlier in the chapter uh, are seldom going to be more accurate than say 5% and this is because of the uh, non-uniformity throughout the reservoir.
and it could go much higher than 5%. Well, that concludes uh, this chapter. This slide will show you some uh, practice problems. In a, another discussion, I'll cover the solution of those practice problems. Thank you.